So we learned last time that uh, Paul's main goal in writing Titus on the island of Crete was to tell him about God's plan to transform people into truly beautiful people. Now, all of us have some level of moral and spiritual ugliness in us, but the Cretans were particularly challenged ethically and habitually challenged over many centuries uh, to such a degree that we see here in the quote that Paul offers from a Cretan poet that the Cretans were always liars, lazy stomachs, and evil animals. Uh, they were particularly deficient in uh, their character. And so God's uh, virtues, the fact that God never lies, the fact that God is gracious, the fact that God is, is good and loving, uh, lo uh, lo lovingly kind, that his virtues, which are beautiful, uh, are an answer to this problem. So Paul writes to Titus to remind him and to encourage him that God's plan uh, will truly transform the Cretan ugliness, internal ugliness in their character, uh, and transform them into truly beautiful people. So the task that uh, we had last week was to try and figure out um, what is this little phrase here in chapter 1, verse 1, uh, what does this mean that um, our faith and, and knowledge of the truth is uh, accords with godliness? What does it mean that it accords with godliness? And how is that important in the letter? Uh, so, in order to answer that, uh, we need to pay attention to the details around that uh, statement. So, for example, Paul uh, speaks of how um, our faith is the faith of God's elect. That is that uh, there is something that all of the elect of God, all of the chosen of God, all those who are Christians, share. And he emphasizes that again in verse 4. He says to Titus, my true child, in a common faith, which again emphasizes this, this idea that there's something shared by all Christians, Jews, Gentiles, it doesn't matter. There's something common to us all. And that commonness is uh, what you would call a standard or a, uh, a rule, meaning like a ruler, a yardstick, right? If I have a, um, uh, if I have a, a measuring tape and I say something's uh, 12 inches long, a foot long, I expect that if you take your measuring tape out, that the distance is going to be the same when you measure out 12 inches or one foot. That the, the tape measure is a standard. It's a it's a ruler, a yardstick, and um, the the Greek word for this, by the way, is canon, as in like the canon of scripture. So the scripture serves as a sort of, of of a standard or a canon. So anyway, Paul is talking in this opening part of the letter about this canon, this yardstick that's common to all Christians. And, of course, the yardstick is going to be two things. First of all, it's going to be the um, faith of God's elect, and secondly, the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so uh, Paul writes, um, well, it says here in accordance, uh, it says here for the sake of. Actually, if, if you go over here to the, the ASV translation. You'll remember I mentioned it would be good to have this translation. If you go over to this translation, you'll see that it doesn't say for the sake of, but it says according to, in accordance with. Uh, and again, that's the language of, of sort of a standard. Uh, so it's uh, in accordance with the faith. That's the first thing, the faith of God's elect. And the second thing is the knowledge of the truth. There are two um, marks on the yardstick that sort of define the Christian religion. And they are, uh, in terms of our virtues, our personal virtues, they are our faith in God, our, that is to say our trust in God, our, our fundamental confidence in God. That's the appropriate response of a creature to their creator, that we have confidence in him and trust him. And then secondly, uh, that um, we have the knowledge of the truth. In other words, our, our religion, the Christian religion, is not merely hopefulness. It's concrete, solid knowledge of the truth. This is actually the truth. 
Um, and that faith in God and that knowledge of the truth is supposed to be according to or it accords with godliness. That is to say that it's not enough just to say, yeah, I believe God, I trust God, and uh, I know the truth, you know, I know Jesus rose from the dead. That itself isn't enough to say that's Christianity. Christianity has to be transformative. Our, our faith and our knowledge of the truth results in or transforms us into godly people, reverential. We, we truly revere and worship and serve God in, in practical ways. We actually do good works. So if we don't have a godly life, a beautiful life, a morally, spiritually transformed life, that's coming out of our faith in God, our knowledge of the truth, then our faith and knowledge are, as James says in chapter 2, they're dead. They're, not, they're useless. Uh, so they, our faith and knowledge in God has to lead to a transformed life, okay, a, a beautiful life. Uh, that then, of course, raises the question, how does that relate to this idea here? that it's in hope of, or on the basis of the hope, of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Now, I gave that task last week as well, but I think probably we've done enough for one week, so I'll just leave that hanging still as, as, as a, still a task to be resolved, is how does this uh, second piece here relate to the first piece? And I should just say, this is a really common way uh, that we're going to approach these reading guides, which is once we establish, say, what a verse means, like let's just say we, we had just done verse uh, 3, uh, and we had established what that meant, we would then be asking, well, how does verse 4 follow logically upon verse 3? That is, what's the relationship between the one part that follows and the part that you just left? And eventually we sort of build up those parts into a kind of comprehensive whole for the chapter, okay? So if you're going to understand the whole of something, by definition, that means you have to understand it in all of its parts and how all the parts relate to one, to one another. So best wishes, and uh, we'll see you next time.